And yes, all right, there we go. We are set, we are happening, we are go for mission. Um, hi, uh, good to see you all. I'm Tad, as usual, much to my sorrow, but there you go. Um, anyway, good to see you, as I said, and um, it is Sunday, it is 7.01 in California here. Pacific's daylight time. Um, so I am about to commence with some reading. First, um, trying to think if there's anything to tell you guys. It's been a super busy week, but none of it very interesting to relate. Uh, we've had various birthday things and family things and technological crises of various kinds. Um, really not as serious as it sounds, but, you know, just the kind of thing that knocks everything sideways and suddenly changes your entire day into a day of triage, as opposed to actually doing something that you had thought you were going to do. And a number of issues like that. Again, not to complain, it's just life. I remember last time, uh, last week, uh, Deb asked me, well, can you give me such and such information? And I said, okay, well, looking at the week coming up, I'm sure I can start with that on Wednesday, but let's call it Thursday just to be safe. And I assume I can finish it one day, but let's call it Friday just to be extra safe. It's now Sunday. I haven't touched it. So that's an example of how these things happen and how our best laid plans gang aft aglay, as the original poem uh, puts it. Because it's Scottish, see, it's Scottish. They didn't say go wrong or go awry. They said the best laid plans of mice and men gang aft aglay, which basically does mean go awry or goes wrong. Anyway, as long as I am spouting useless facts of no interest to anybody, um, I sent off the, uh, the last few bits and pieces of Into the Narrow Dark which were the acknowledgments, dedication, synopsis, you know, stuff like that, author's note, indexes, which I had a great deal of help with. Um, and uh, as always, I, I thank the folks who helped me um, and our core group of, uh, well, for, at the moment, it's four people who have put in a lot of help. Um, and uh, so I will quickly mention them just in case any of them are out there. And that is uh, Ron Hyde and Ilve... Ilva von Leunesen and Jeremy Ehrman and last but certainly not least, Angela Welchel. And they have all put in a lot of work for me um, on these this new series. Because again, as I mentioned before, at the time I started this back now several years ago, um, I literally had not read the uh, my own books for years, whereas some of my readers had read them several times. And uh, Ron, in fact, had made a, an RPG out of Ostenard or Ostenard, and you can pronounce it either way. I'm really big on that idea. I don't care how people pronounce things. I, as I often say, I get them wrong myself, so don't worry about it. Um, anyway, but Ron had done an RPG, and people who had applied a lot of thought and questions and things they wanted to know and all that, and whereas I'd been writing other books. And except for having briefly scoped a few pieces of it before I wrote the short story, The Burning Man, or novella, whatever you want to call it, I really hadn't. I hadn't even gone back to it at all. Um, so I was forced to sit down and read the whole thing and then read it again a few months later um, so that I had a decent working knowledge again of what all was in it. But even so, there's still facts and things that I, I don't remember until one of my friends says, oh, by the way, <laughs> by the way, you've got that wrong. That character isn't like that, or that character's dead, or that character is, you know, in an entire, entirely different place, and you have to explain how they got to where they are now, and things like that. So I'm very, very grateful, needless to say, for that, um, because one of the things that I do pride myself on is the sort of rigor of the world building and that the worlds have to make sense before one can completely let one's imagination fly free. That the, the given constraints have to apply. Um, you know, in a world that has magic, yeah, you can have magic, but you have to have some limits on it. You have to explain a little bit about how it works or about why it doesn't get used all the time, why it isn't like electricity in our modern society, which basically, you know, most of the globe has access to and uses every day. Um, so 
that kind of stuff is really important to to make consistent. It doesn't have to be realistic. It just has to be consistent, and that's super important. Anyway, so that's finally Into the Narrow Dark has flown free. If you love it, let it go. If it loves you, it will return to you, or if it was meant to be, it will return to you. But I know it will return to me, and at the very least, it will return to me in the form of my uh, <laughs> my contractually obligated set of copies that I will get. Um, let me see, what else? What else of interest? Not much, as I said, we've had a very bitty week with lots and lots of different things going on. Um, weird, crazy stuff with banks and cable suppliers and you know, all kinds of stuff. So I, it, none of it interesting, none of it worth talking about, obviously, because everybody has this kind of stuff to deal with if they live in the modern world. Um, but uh, nonetheless, it has, com it has commanded the week and has left things a little confused. We do have a family birthday this week, which is very nice and which we uh, just are celebrating today and then we'll be celebrating, I guess, for a few days to come because as always with our family, the presents don't all show up on time. As a matter of fact, very few of them show up on time. Everybody's kind of gotten into the habit of saying like, oh, well, I can get this. And then they wait till the last moment and they order it and people, and this is everybody in our family. And then, of course, you know, what, what you get for your birthday is you get a piece of paper with a picture of the thing on it. That's, that's how it works. So there's, there was a great deal of the ooing and aahing over pictures of things as opposed to actual things. Um, but the birthday celebration went forward as planned and went well. And yeah, so I think that's basically where I am at the moment. So I am going to, I wish I had more to relate. And when I do have news that I can relate, I promise you I will. Um, but in the in the uh, instances where I don't, unless I think of a story to tell or something, I'm not going to just waste time. So let's skip forward and see who's here checking in. Um, and the first up is Jim. Yo, Jim, how you doing? Jared, Grand Poobah of the Four Book Trilogy. That's me. That's me. Having a good evening? I think so. I just woke up. I, I hit the late afternoon and I crashed out for a while. So... Um, I haven't recaffeinated or anything, so you, you'll have to put up with me if I'm stumbling a bit. With luck, I'll have a section of the book where everybody is speaking with an American accent, and I don't have to think my way through um, the complicated and undoubtedly probably insulting um, aspect of me trying to do characters, uh, several different character accents for several different people, because I, you know, I don't, I try to do different accents even if they're all from the same place. Um, just to separate the characters out. Anyway, so I, I am having a good evening, though. Just the mere fact that I'm sitting up and talking and uh, all of my family are, seem to be well. That's, that's a good evening as far as I'm concerned. So thank you for the wishes. Ray, greetings. Good to see you. And who else have we got here? Whoops, it skipped down. Jennifer, hello. Good to see you. And crew. Now, if this is a crew, uh, then I warn you all, the ship is very leaky. <laughs> Emily, hello. Good to see you. Becca, pleasure. Barban, hello, hello. Sasha, where I, was I live streaming at four in the morning recently? I was live, well, it depends on where you are. Um, I live stream from 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. my time here in California. So if you're in another part of the country, and I don't want to mess with this by checking, you know, your details if there are any to be had. Um, but it depends. So if you were in some other part of the country um, that is two hours ahead, then yes, I was just getting done with my live stream at 2 a.m., which is another reason I had to crash out in the middle of the afternoon today. Um, I hope that answers your question. If not, if that timing thing doesn't work for you, then maybe I'm just ubiquitous now. Maybe, you know, I'm like one of those Colossus, the Forbin Project kind of computer persons that just kind of suddenly becomes omnipotent or Johnny Depp in that forgettable movie where he becomes omnipotent and omnipresent all over the, 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 the world because he gets eaten by a computer or something. I don't remember it. It wasn't a super great movie. Anyway, continuing on, blah, 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 blah Tad, just keep your mouth moving. Steve, <laughs> hi, how are you? Claudia, hello, hello, good to see you. Andrew, hello. Um, well, you've got a daughter. I have, my kids are now 25 and 20, 
two, um, my biological kids, and then we've got two other kids too, who are kind of roughly in the same general area of age. So um, if you've got a daughter you're still putting to bed, you're talking about nostalgia city for me. Um, my daughter, I can't even reach my daughter's bed. <laughs> Her room is such a horrendous pit of despair and clut clutter and clog and things like that. Um, anyway, but good to see you. A pleasure as always. And uh, we miss you here on the West Coast. Tim, greetings, greetings, greetings from the greater Toronto-ish area, says Tim. And hello to the greater Toronto-ish area in turn. I've only been to Toronto once, and I really like the city. Um, I'd love to get back again, but as you know, there hasn't been much traveling the last few years. Kristen, hello. As always, a pleasure to see you. Sally, good morning. And who else? Is there anybody I haven't said hello to yet in this group? Anne, hello. Where did the kitty go? Oh, the kitty's around somewhere. The kitty is in her in, in her bed, which is where she spends most of her time. I think I've mentioned in the past that this cat was kind of semi-rescued and that she belonged to somebody who was never home. Um, and to be honest, from what I know, was maybe not super into being a pet owner um, because we true dedicated pet owners know how exhausting it is and how it's it's never over and even when you're not around them you're feeling guilty that you're not doing something for them it's like children basically so she came to us at a time when we still had jupiter our venerable and beloved weirdo cat who finally passed on a couple of years ago um so lily came to live with us when we had jupiter and theoretically as a companion for jupiter but all he ever did was be a butt to her um, well, not always. They, they occasionally would come in and find them cuddled up together. But mostly Jupiter was just a grumpy old man. And Lily just kind of, not surprisingly, just went, well, fine, if that's the way you're going to be, and just kind of went on with her own life. But as a result of her upbringing or whatever, again, we're not really sure because we kind of took her in, um, she's not really acclimated. She's she's not particularly socialized in a lot of ways. I mean, not that she's mean or anything. She's not. She's very sweet-tempered. But she's not socialized to a lot of things. She doesn't want to go out. You know, we have to actually lead her outside if we want to take her outside for a little while. Um, and she's very quick to go back in. And and she does not really, you know, you can leave the door open all day and she'll just stay inside. She's not particularly interested in the outside world. And unfortunately, one of our dogs, our big dog Johnny, never understood that cats are supposed to be friends, not food. Um, and uh, the entire thing with Johnny, the first day that we had him, began with um, me trying to introduce him to Jupiter, who we did have at the time. And I kind of held Jupiter out carefully with Jupiter cradled in my arms and leaned down toward Johnny. And Johnny just kind of went and just sucked Jupiter's entire hind leg into his large doggy mouth. And everybody, all the rest of the family who were there for the introduction started screaming and yelling. And meanwhile, I shoved my, not to make myself the hero, just to tell you how it happened. I shoved my hand in between John's upper teeth and his, his, and the cat. So I'm, everybody's yelling, oh my God, what are we going to do? And I'm going, um, guys, whatever you're going to do, let's start by not screaming because that's making both the cat and the dog nervous. And at any moment, this is going to turn into a tragedy. I don't think I was laughing, but I, you know, I was the one with my hand in the dog's mouth and the tooth slowly pushing down into my wrist, um, rather painfully. So um, I was just kind of going, let's all calm down and let's figure this out. And eventually we extracted Jupiter's back leg. I mean, Johnny didn't hurt him. Uh, I think he shocked Jupiter a bit, but uh, Johnny didn't hurt him. But he kind of was like, oh, I'm being offered a treat and tried to suck him down like a catfish takes a smaller prey, you know, just... <laughs> Um, and eventually we got the two of them separated and it quickly became very clear that however Johnny had been raised, because Johnny is a rescue also, and this is one of the things about rescues, you don't always know what they're like um, and what their past history has been until you get them in unusual situations and see. Fortunately, Johnny is a very kind dog. Unfortunately, Johnny is not kind to cats. He doesn't understand, uh, literally does not understand and at this point cannot probably easily be taught that cats are not something you chase and attack. 
So the cat lives downstairs and the dogs live upstairs. Um, it, it works all right because the cat, as I said, she doesn't want to go out. She really doesn't. She's not interested. She's been an indoor cat all of her life. She had smaller space to live in when before we had her. She gets me in here every day and we hang out and do stuff. But it is uh, it is funny that she just she's like one of those things you hear about a old prisoner gets released and doesn't know what to do with themselves because they're not used to being able to do what they want. And you open the door to Lily and she just kind of looks at it, you know, like, what, what? And you're like, okay, well, you know, you want to come out? We'll try. And she's kind of like, I don't think so. It's weird. So we leave her alone most of the time. But anyway, so she's just over there on her chair, um, just out of sight of the camera. And anybody else I need to say hello to? Nope, I think I've said hello to everybody here. So I think at this point I will start reading. And what we were reading last time, we had a whole section where Rini and along with Kabu and her father and others uh, made their way into this um, decommissioned Air Force base, um, which is where they're going to hope to be able to hide, but simultaneously get back online with some kind of long-term life support and find out what's going on with this other land network that they're beginning to realize is a big weird thing and that it's not merely Rini's little brother Stephen who's been affected by it um, but that there may be others as well including uh, people who've been murdered over the other land so that was the previous section now we have Orlando um, Orlando Gardner, who has lost his his um, his hero character Thargor that he plays in these online games, not in the Otherland Network, I hasten to say, just the regular internet that we all live with, and this is sometime in the nearish future. Um, so he has just found out that he was driven off by a message that contained the same golden city that Rini and the others are looking for, um, and that caused him to lose attention and to get killed by a very low level monster in the simulation. So he has been told that essentially, sorry, you're not getting back in. And he's also looking for Fredericks, his friend, because he hasn't seen Fredericks since they both got into Treehouse, but then were thrown out again. Um, and Treehouse is again, still in the regular net, but, but kind of separate, distributed, it's a place for hackers and anarchists and whatnot. Anyway, so that's where we are. Now Orlando is in his electronic cottage, or Elcot, or cot. He looked around his cot with disaffection. It was fine in its way, but it was so uh, young. The trophies in particular, which had meant so much when he acquired them, now seemed faintly embarrassing. And a sim world window full of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs! They were such a kid thing. Even the MBC window now seemed pathetic, souvenir of an obsession with the idea that only nostalgics and a few wareheads even cared about anymore. Human beings weren't ever going out into space. It was too expensive and too complicated. Taxpayers in a country that had to, had to turn its sports coliseums into tent cities and house its excess prison population on barges, weren't going to pay billions of dollars to send a few people to another star system. And the idea of making a nearer planet like Mars habitable was already beginning to fade. And even if everything changed, and humans suddenly decided once more that space was the place, Orlando Gardner would certainly never get there. Bezo, he said, come here. His agent squeezed through a crack in the wall, legs flailing, and skittered toward him. I'm all ears, boss. Uh, anything on Fredericks? Not a whisper. I'm monitoring, but there hasn't been any sign of activity. Orlando stared at the pyramid of trophy cases and wondered what it would feel like simply to throw them away, to have them cleared right out of his system memory. Experimentally, he hid them. The corner of the virtual room suddenly looked naked. Find me his parents' home number? Fredericks? In West Virginia? Somewhere in the hills? Bezel beetled a wobbly single eyebrow. You can't narrow it down any? Preliminary says there's more than 200 listings under the name Fredericks in West Virginia. 
Orlando side. I don't know. We never talk about stuff like that. I don't think he has any brothers or sisters. Parents work for the government. Uh, I think they have a dog. He thought hard. He must have registered some of this information in the middle country when he first signed up. Doesn't mean it's available to the public, said Beazle darkly. I'll see what I can find. He disappeared through a hole in the floor. Hey, Beazle, Orlando shouted. Bug, come back. The agent crawled out from the, from beneath the virtual couch, dragging his legs in a self-pitying way. Yes, boss. I live to save you, boss. What is it now, boss? Do you think this room is stupid? Beazle sat motionless, looking for all the world like the discarded head of a mop. For a moment, Orlando thought he had gone past the bounds of the agent's gear. Do you think it's stupid? Beazle asked at last. Don't mirror back what I say. Orlando was exasperated. That was the cheapest kind of artificial life programming trick. When in doubt, answer a question with the same question. Just tell me, in your opinion, is it stupid or not? Beazle froze again. Orlando had a sudden pang of worry. What if he had pushed it too hard? It was only software, after all. And why was he asking a piece of gear or something like this anyway? If Fredericks were around, he would be telling utter Orlando just how utterly he scanned. I don't know what stupid means in this context, boss, said Beazle finally. Orlando was embarrassed. It was like forcing someone to admit in public that they were illiterate. Yeah, you're right. Go see if you can find that phone number. Beazle obligingly dropped out of sight once more. Orlando settled back to think of something to do to occupy the time while Beazle did his work. It was about four in the afternoon, which meant he only had a little while until Vivian and Conrad came home and he had to surface, so he couldn't afford to get into anything too complicated like gaming. Not that he had any particular urge to get involved in any games at present. The Golden City and the several layers of mystery that surrounded it had made chasing monsters in the middle country seem a bit of a waste of time. He created a screen in the middle of his room and began flicking through net modes. Net nodes. He browsed for a while in Lambda Mall, but the idea of actually buying anything made him feel depressed, and nothing looked very interesting anyway. He jumped through the entertainment channels, watching a few minutes here and there of various shows and flicks and straight commercial presentations, letting the noises and effects wash over him like water. He scanned some news headlines, but nothing sounded worth watching. At last, he vanished the Elcott, went full surround, and wandered into the interactive sections. After specifying view only, he watched almost half an hour's worth of a program on living at the bottom of the sea until he got bored with floating around like a fish while people demonstrated underwater farming, then began to flick through some of the specialized children's entertainment. As the nodes flipped by, a familiar, exaggerated smile caught his attention. I don't know why they stole my handkerchief, said Uncle Jingle. All I know is, it's not fair! All the children on the show, Jingle Jungle Crew, laughed and clapped their hands. Uncle Jingle! Orlando, just about to shift again, paused. He dismissed the who are you query that popped up at the 10 second mark. He was way too old to sign on, and anyway, he didn't particularly want any attention at the present. Still, Orlando continued to watch, fascinated. He hadn't seen Uncle Jingle for years. Snot fair. Man, the scanny things you watch when you're a little kid. Well, continued Uncle, bobbing his tiny head, whatever the reason, I'm going to track that handkerchief down. And when I find it, I think I'm going to teach Pantalona and old Mr. Daddy Weiner a lesson. Who wants to help me? Several of the participating kids, promoted out of the daily audience of millions by some arcane selection process, jumped up and down and shouted. Orlando stared, fascinated. 
He had forgotten how weird Uncle Jingle was with his huge toothy smile and tiny black button eyes. He looked like a two-legged shark or something. Let's sing a song, okay? said the host. That'll make the trip go faster. If you don't know the words, touch my hand. Orlando did not touch Uncle's hand and was thus spared the additional indignity of local language subtitles, but was still forced to listen to dozens of happy, childish voices singing about the sins of Uncle Jingle's arch nemesis, Pantalona. She simply loves to be unfair, that vixen with the corkscrew hair. She doesn't wash her underwear, Pantalona Peach Pit. She tosses stones at little birds. She loves to shout out naughty words. She even eats the doggies. Food, Pantalona Peach Pit. Orlando grimaced. He decided that after a childhood spent in the opposite camp, his sympathies were beginning to shift to Pantalona, the red-headed renegade. Uncle Jingle and his entourage were now dancing and singing down the street past the graffiti wall headed for a rendezvous with the lost handkerchief and vengeance against Uncle's enemies. Orlando, nostalgia more than satisfied, was just about to shift to something else when a slogan on the simulated wall caught his attention. Painted letters that read, Wicked Tribe, Ruling Tribe. Orlando leaned forward. He had thought that with his one indigo favor called in, he was out of connections to Treehouse, and through Treehouse to the mystery of the Griffin and whatever light that might shine on the radiant, magical city. But here, here, of all places, was a familiar name, a name that, properly followed, might get him back into Treehouse. It had been a long time since he had been a regular fan of Uncle Jingle's Jungle, and he had forgotten more than simply why he had liked it in the first place. <coughs> There was, some, <clears throat> there was some routine for posting a message, but he was damned if he could remember it. Instead, he pointed at Bob the Ball, the chuckling sphere that always bounced along through the air just behind Uncle Jingle. After he had pointed long enough for it to register as more than a casual gesture, Bob the Ball appeared to burst open, although none of the other viewers would see that unless they too were request requesting help disgorging a number of pictographs designed to help Uncle Jingle's young audience make choices. Orlando found the one that concerned making new friends and entered his message looking for wicked tribe. He hesitated for a moment, then left a dead drop address for contacts. There was no immediate answer, but he decided to stay connected for a while, just in case. Oh, look! Uncle Jingle did a little dance of pleasure, his long tuxedo coat flapping. Look who's waiting for us at the Bridge of Size. It's the Mingle Pig. <gasps> but, oh, look, the Mingle Pig is big, big, big. The entire company of the Jingle Jungle crew, along with an invisible worldwide audience, turned to look. Already as large as a house and growing larger by the second was the uncle's was uncle's friend and erstwhile pet, the Mingle Pig, an amorphous aggregation of dozens of porcine legs, trotters, snouts, eyes, and curly pink tails. Orlando felt a moment of recognition as he saw for the first time in its wriggling outline the roots of his own bezel bug design. But where he had once found the mingle pig thrillingly funny, he now found it centerless, squirming, unpleasant. Never spend too long on the bridge of size, declared Uncle Jingle as seriously as if he were explaining the second law of thermodynamics. You'll get real big or you'll get real small. And that's what and what's happened to the mingle pig? He's big shouted the Jingle Jungle crew, seeming unfa seemingly unfazed by the anemone-like mass that now loomed over them like a mountain. We have to help him get small again. Uncle looked around, his licorice drop eyes wide. Who can think of something to help him? Stick a pin in him. Call Zoomer Ziz. Tell him to stop it. 
Make him go to the other end of the bridge, suggested one of the children at last, a little girl by the sound of her, whose sim was a toy panda. Uncle nodded happily. I think that's a very good idea. Uncle needed a split second to call up the name. Michiko? Come on, if we all shouted at once, maybe he'll hear us. But we have to shout loud because his ears are very high up now. All the children began to screech. The mingle pig, like a particularly grotesque parade float, losing its air, flattened itself toward the ground, listening. At the children's direction, it moved a little way back along the bridge, but then stopped, confused. The crew began to scream even more shrilly. The din became excruciatingly painful. Wicked tribe or not, Orlando had reached his limit. He entered his message so that it would continue to appear on the Making New Friends band, then exited Uncle Jingle's jungle. Orlando! Someone was shaking him. Orlando! He opened his eyes. Vivian's face was very close, full of concern and irritation, a combination Orlando was used to seeing. I'm okay. I was just watching a show. How can you not hear me? I don't like that at all. He shrugged. I was just concentrating, and I had it up pretty loud. It was this really interesting thing about farming in the ocean. That ought to hold her, he figured. Vivian approved of educational programs. He didn't want to tell her that, since he hadn't set the T-jack to keep a line open for normal external input, that is, stuff going from his actual ear to his auditory nerve, he hadn't heard her any more than he would have if she'd been shouting his name in Hawaii. She stared, dissatisfied, although she was clearly not sure why. How are you feeling? Sore. It was true. His joints had already been aching, and... Vivian's energetic wake-up hadn't helped any. The pain blocker must have worn off. Vivian pulled a pair of dermals from the drawer beside the bed, one for pain, the other his evening anti-inflammatory fix. He tried to put them on, but his fingers ached, and he fumbled them. Vivian frowned and took them from him, applying them with practiced skill to his bony arms. What were you doing, plowing the bottom of the sea yourself? No wonder you're hurting thrashing around on that stupid net. He shook his head. You know I can turn off my own muscle reactions when I'm online, Vivian. That's the great thing about the plug-in interfaces. For the fortune they cost, they'd better do something. She paused. Their conversation seemed to have moved through its usual arc, and now Orlando expected her either to shake her head and leave or seize the chance to offer a few more dire predictions. Instead, she sat herself on the edge of the bed, careful not to put weight on his legs or feet. Orlando, are you scared? Do you mean right now or ever? Either. I mean... She looked away then. She looked away, then determinedly returned her gaze to him. He was struck for the first time in a while by how pretty she was. There were lines on her forehead and at the corners of her eyes and mouth, but she still had a firm jaw and her very clear blue eyes. In the dim afternoon light with day fast fading, she looked no different from the woman who had held him when he was still young enough to be held. I mean, it isn't fair, Orlando. It's not. Your illness shouldn't happen to the worst person in the world. And you're not that at all. You may drive me crazy sometimes, but you're smart and sweet and very brave. Your father and I love you a lot. He opened his mouth, but no sounds came. I wish there was something else I could tell you besides be brave. I wish I could be brave for you. Oh God, I wish I could. She blinked, then kept her eyes closed for a long moment. One hand stretched out to rest lightly on his chest. You know that, don't you? He swallowed and nodded. This was embarrassing and painful, but in a way it also felt good. Orlando didn't know which was worse. 
I love you too, Vivian, he said at last. Conrad too. She looked at him. Her smile was crooked. We know that being on the net means a lot to you, that you have friends there and, and, and something like a real life. Yes, but we miss you, honey. We want to see as much of you as we can while I'm still around, he finished for her. She flinched as though he had shouted. That's part of it, she said finally. Orlando felt her then in a way he hadn't for some time, saw the strain she was under, the fears that his condition brought. In a way, he was being cruel, spending so much time in a world that to her was invisible and unreachable. But now, more than ever, he had to be there. He considered telling her about the city, the golden city, but he could not imagine a way he could say it that wouldn't make it sound really stupid, like a sick kid's impossible daydream. After all, he couldn't really convince himself it was anything other than that. He and Vivian and Conrad already walked a very difficult line with pity. He didn't want to do anything that would make things more difficult for everyone. I know, Vivian. Maybe, maybe we could put aside some time every day to talk, just like we're talking now. Her face was so full of poorly hidden hope that he could barely watch. A little time. You can tell me about the net, all the things you've seen. He sighed, but kept it nearly silent. He was still waiting for the pain blocker to take effect, and it was hard to be patient even with a person you loved. Loved. That was a strange thought. He did love Vivian, though, and even Conrad, although sightings of his father sometimes seemed as rare as those of other fabled monsters like Nessie or Sasquatch. Hey, boss! said Beazle into his ear. I think I got something for you. Orlando pushed himself a little more upright, ignoring the throbbing of his joints and put on a tired smile. Okay, Vivian, it's a deal. But not right now, okay? I'm, I'm feeling kind of sleepy. He disliked himself more than he usually did for lying. But in a funny way, it was her own fault. She had reminded him how little time he truly had. Fine, honey. You just lie down again, then. Do you want something to drink? No, thanks. He slid back down and closed his eyes, then listened to her close the door. What do you have? I got a phone number, for one thing. Beazel made the clicking noise he used to indicate self-satisfaction. But first, I think you got a call coming in. Something named Lolo. Orlando shut his eyes, but this time left his external auditory channels open. He flicked to his electronic cot and opened a screen. His caller was a lizard with a mouth full of fangs and an exaggerated artifact strewn topknot of goggle boy hair. At the last moment, Orlando remembered to turn up his own volume so he could whisper. He didn't want to bring Vivian back into the room to check on him. You're Lolo. Maybe, the lizard said. The voice was altered with all kinds of irritating noise, hums, scrapes, and trendy distortion. Why you beep the wicked tribe? Orlando's heart quickened. He hadn't expected to hear anything back on his query so soon. Are you one of them? He didn't remember a Lolo, but there had been quite a few monkeys. The lizard stared at him balefully. Flying now, it said. Wait! Don't go! I, I met the Wicked Tribe in Treehouse. I, I look like this. He flashed an image of his Thargor Sim across. If you weren't there, you can ask the rest of them. Ask... He racked his brain, struggling to remember. Ask... Zuni! Yeah! And I think there was someone named Casper, too? Caspar? The lizard tilted his head. Caspar, he's, he's near me. Zuni, chop it. She far, far crash. But still no gimme. Why you beep wickedness? 
It was hard to tell whether English was Lolo's second language or the reptile-wearing tribesperson was simply so sunk in kid-speak as to be almost unintelligible, even to Orlando. He guessed it might be some of both. Look, I need to talk to the wicked tribe. I'm involved in a special operation, and I need their help. Help? Craig time, maybe? Candy? What's the charge? It's a secret. I told you. I can only talk about it at a meeting of the wicked tribe, with everyone sworn to secrecy. Lolo considered this. You funny, funny man? It asked at last. Baby bouncer? Skin stim? Sin sim? No, no, it's a secret mission. You understand that? Very important. Very secret. The tiny eyes got even tinier as Lolo thought some more. Zon, Lascom, flying now. The contact was ended. Yeah. Jang, that's something gone right for once. He summoned Bezel. You said you found a phone number for Fredericks? Only one that makes sense. These government people, they don't want anyone finding out where they live, you know. They buy those data eaters, send them out to chew up anything tagged to their names that's floating around the net. So how did you find it? Well, uh, I'm not sure I did, but I think it's right. Mine a child named Sam, a couple of other hits as well. Think about data eaters, they leave holes, and sometimes the holes tell you as much as the things that used to be there. Orlando laughed. You're pretty smart for an imaginary friend. I'm good gear, boss. Call it for me. The number beeped several times, then the house system on the other end, having decided that Orlando's account number didn't fit the first level profile for a nuisance call, passed him through to the message center. Orlando indicated his desire to talk with a living human being. Hello? It was a woman's voice, tinged with a slight southern accent. Uh, hello, is this the Fredericks residence? Yes, it is. Can I help you? I'd like to speak to Sam, please. Oh, Sam's not here right now. Who's calling? Orlando Gardner. I'm a friend. I haven't met you, have I? Or at least your name isn't familiar, but then... The woman paused for a moment. She went away. Sorry, it's a bit confusing here, she said when she came back. The maid's just dropped something. What did you say your name was? Rolando? I'll tell Sam you called when she gets back from soccer. Jizz, I mean, thanks. It, it took an, in its, an instant to register. She? Just a second, ma'am, I think. But the woman had clicked off. Bezel, was that the only number you had that matched? Because that's not the one. Sorry, boss. Go ahead and kick me. Closest to fitting the profile. I'll try again, but I can't promise anything. Two hours later, Orlando started up from a half-sleep. The lights in his room were on dim his IV throwing a gallows shadow onto the, wall beside the, onto the wall beside him. He turned down the Medea's Kids record that he was playing softly on his auditory shunt. A troubling thought had lodged itself in his mind, and he could not make it go away. Bezel, get me that number again. He made his way back through the screening system. After a short delay, the same woman's voice came on. This is the person who called before. Is Sam back yet? Oh, yes, I forgot to tell her you called. I'll just see. There was another wait, but this one seemed painfully long because Orlando didn't know what he was waiting for. Yes? Just from that one word he knew. Because it wasn't processed to sound masculine, it was higher than he was used to, but he knew that voice. Fredericks? The silence was complete. Orlando waited it out. Gardner? Is that you? Orlando felt something like rage, but it was an emotion as confusing as it was painful. You bastard, he said at last. Why didn't you tell me? I'm 
Sorry. Frederick's new voice was faint, but it's not like you think. What's to think? I thought you were my friend. I thought you were my male friend. Was it funny listening to me talk about girls? Letting me make a total scan box out of myself? He suddenly remembered one now cringeworthy occasion where he had talked about how he would put together his ideal female from the different body parts of famous net stars. I, I, I just... He was suddenly unable to say more. But it's not like you think. Not exactly. I mean, it wasn't supposed to... Fredericks didn't say anything for a moment. When the familiar but unfamiliar girl's voice spoke again, it was flat and sorrowful. How did you get this number? Tracked it down. I was looking for you because I was worried about you, Fredericks. Or should I call you Samantha? He put as much scorn into it as he could summon. It's, it's Salome, actually. Sam was a joke of my dad's when I was little, but why didn't you tell me? I mean, it's one thing when you're just messing around on the net, but we were friends, man. He laughed bitterly. Man? That was it. See, by the time we were friends, I didn't know how to just tell you. I was afraid you wouldn't want to string with me anymore. That's your excuse? Frederick sounded on the verge of tears. I, I didn't know what to do. Fine. Orlando felt as though he had left his body, like he was just a cloud of anger floating free. Fine. I guess you're not dead or anything. That's what I called to find out in the first place. Orlando! But this time, he was the one who hung up. They're out there. So close, you can almost smell them. No, you can smell them, in a way. The suits pick up all manner of subtle clues, extending the human sensory range so that you can feel nearly a score of them moving towards you through the fog, just the way a mastiff can scent a cat walking on the back fence. You look around, but Olikov and Punyi still haven't returned. They picked a bad moment to check the signaling equipment at the landing site. Of course, there aren't many good moments on this hellhole of a planet. Something moves out on the perimeter. You focus the filter lenses in your helmet. It's not a human silhouette. Your hand is already extended, your gauntlet beam primed, and it takes only a flick of thought to send a horizontal thread of fire razoring toward the intruder. The thing is fast, though, horribly fast. The laser tears another piece off the wreckage of the first expedition ship, but the thing that had crouched in front of it is gone vanished back into the mist like a bad dream. Your suit sensors suddenly blast into alarm mode. Behind you, half a dozen loping shapes. Idiot! You curse yourself for being distracted, even as you turn and throw out a coruscating tangle of fire. The oldest trick in the book. These things hunt in packs, after all. For their resem all their resemblance to earth crustaceans, the creatures are terrifyingly smart. Two of the creatures go down, but one of them gets back up and drags itself to shelter on one fewer jointed leg than usual. Illuminated by the residual fires from your assault, it darts a look at you as it goes, and you imagine you can see an active malice in the strange, wet eyes. Malicious giant bugs! Orlando's finer sentiments went into revolt. This was the last time he'd ever trust a review from the bartender at the living end. This kind of crap was years out of date. Still, he'd paid for it, or rather his parents were going to when the monthly net bill was deducted. He might as well see if it got better. So far, it was a pretty standard grade shoot 'em up with nothing that appealed to his own fairly particular interests. There's a fireworks burst of light along the perimeter. Your heart leaps. That's a human weapon. Olikov and Punyi. You rake a distant section of the perimeter to provide cover for your comrades, but also to let them know where you are. Another burst of fire. Then a dark figure breaks into the clearing and sprints towards you, 
pursued by three shambling, hopping shapes. You don't have a very good angle, but you manage to knock one of them down. The pursued figure flings itself forward and rolls over the edge of the trench, leaving you an unencumbered shot at the things following it. You widen the angle, sacrifices, sacrificing kill power for coverage. They are caught, jigging helplessly in the beam as the air around them superheats. You keep it on them for almost a minute despite the drain of battery power until they burst into a swirl of carbon particles and are carried away on the wind. There is something about these creatures that makes you want to kill them deader than dead. Something like what? Do they try to sell you memberships to religious nodes? I mean, how bad could they be? Orlando was having trouble keeping his mind on the simulation. He kept thinking of Fredericks. No, he realized, not about Fredericks so much as the gap where Fredericks used to be. He had thought once that it was strange to have a friend you'd never met. Now it was even stranger, losing a friend you'd never really had. Olikov crawls towards you down the length of the trench. His, her right arm is mostly gone. There is a raw-looking blister of heavy plastic just above her elbow, where the suit has sealed off the wound site. Through the viewplate, Olikov's face is shockingly white. You cannot help remembering that planet fall on Decimer One. That had been a good time. You and Olikov and ten days leave. The memory rises up before you. Olikov as she emerged from a mountain lake, dripping, naked, her pale breasts like snowdrifts. You made love for hours with only the trees as witnesses, urging each other on, knowing that your time was short that there might never be a day like this again. Pony, they got him, she moans. The terror in her voice snaps you back to the present. The atmosphere distortion is so great that even this close you can barely hear her voice for the noise on the channel. Horrible. Decimer One is light years away now, forever lost. There is no time to help or even to humor her. Can you shoot? Do you have any charge left in your gauntlet? They took him, she screams, furious at your seeming indifference. There is something irreparably broken in her voice. They captured him. They've taken him down into their nest. They were, <coughs> they were putting something through his eyes as they dragged him away. You shudder. At the end, you'll save the last charge of the gauntlet for yourself. You've heard rumors of what these creatures do to their prey. You will not allow that to happen to you. Olikov has slumped to the ground, her shivers rapidly becoming convulsive. Blood is dripping back from her injured arm onto her, into her helmet. The seals are not working properly. You pause, unsure of what to do, then your suit sensors begin to shrill again. You look up to see a dozen many-jointed shapes, each the size of a small horse, skittering towards you across the smoking, debris-strewn planetary surface. Olikov's sobbing has become a dying person's hitch and wheeze and boss. Hey, boss, let those poor imitations alone. I gotta talk to you. Damn it, Bezel. I hate it when you do that. It was just starting to get good. And God knew distraction had been hard enough to come by during the last week. He looked around his cot with irritation. Even without the trophies, it still looked pretty dismal. The decor definitely needed to be changed. Sorry, but you told me you wanted to know if you had a contact from that wicked tribe group. They're on the line? No, but they just sent you a message. You want to see it? Orlando suppressed his irritation. Yes, damn it. Play it. A congregation of yellow squiggles appeared in the middle of the room. Orlando frowned and brought up the magnification. At the point where he could see the figures clearly, they had very poor resolution. Either way, squinting at the fuzzy forms made his eyes hurt. The monkeys hovered in a small orbital cloud. As one of them spoke... The others went on smacking each other and flying in tight circles. 
Wicked tribe, we'll meet you, said the foreground simian, melodramatically pre melodramatic presentation belied by the pushing and shoving in the background. The spokes monkey wore the same cartoonish grin as all the others, and Orlando could not tell whether the voice was one he'd seen, this was one he'd heard before or not. Wicked tribe will meet you in special secret tribe club bunker in treehouse. A time and node address flashed up full of childish misprintings. The message ended. Orlando frowned. Send a return message, Bezel. Tell them I can't get into Treehouse, so they either have to get me in or else meet me here in the inner district. Got it, boss. Orlando sat himself in midair and looked at the MBC window. The little digging drones were still hard at work, pursuing their goals with mindless application. Orlando felt strange. He should have been excited, or at least satisfied. He had opened up a connection back into Treehouse. But instead, he felt depressed. They're little kids, he thought. Just micros. And I'm going to trick them into doing what? Breaking the law? Helping me hack into something? And what if I'm right and there are big-time people involved in this? Then what am I getting him into? And for what? For a picture. An image. For something he had seen for just a few moments and which might mean anything or absolutely nothing. But it's all I've got left. Okay, in the, this, uh, there's a little tiny bit left. I'm going to read it. It may go a minute or two past the top. It was a closet. He could tell that by the slightly musty scent of clothing and the faint skeletal lines of coat hangers revealed by the light seeping in from the crack beneath the door. He was in a closet, and someone outside was looking for him. Long ago, when his parents still had visitors, his cousins had once come for Christmas. His problem had been less obvious then, and although they asked him more questions about his illness than he would have liked, in a strange way he had been pleased to be the center of attention and had enjoyed their visit. They had taught him lots of games, the sort that solitary children like himself usually only played in VR. One of them was hide-and-go-seek. It had made an incalculable impression on him, the feverish excitement of hiding, the waiting in the dark, breathless, while it hunted for him. On the third or fourth game, he had found a place in the closet off his parents' bathroom, cleverly deceptive because he had to remove and hide one of the shelves to fit into it, and had remained there, undiscovered, until the Ollie Ollie Oxen Free had been called. That triumphant moment, hearing the surrender of his distant enemy, was one of the few purely happy memories of his life. So, why then, as he crouched in the darkness while something fumblingly investigated the room outside, was he now so terrified? Why was his heart pattering like a jack-lighted deer's? Why did his skin feel like it was trying to slide all the way around to the back of his body? The thing outside, whatever it was, for some reason he could not imagine it as a person, but only as a faceless, shapeless presence, surely did not know where he was, Otherwise, why would it not simply pull open the closet door? Unless it did know, and was enjoying the game, reveling in its power and his helplessness. It was a thing, he realized. That was what terrified him so. It wasn't one of his cousins, or his father, or even some Baroque monster from the Middle Country. It was a thing, and it his lungs hurt. He had been holding his breath without realizing it. Now he wanted nothing more than to gasp in a great swallow of fresh air, but he did not dare make a noise. There was a scraping outside, then silence. Where was it now? Standing just on the other side of the closet door, listening, waiting for that one telltale noise? And most frightening of all, he realized, was that other than the thing outside, there was no one else in the house. He was alone with the thing that was just now pulling the closet door open. Alone. In the dark, 
holding a scream clenched tight in his throat. He closed his eyes and prayed for the game to end. I brought you some painkillers, boss. You were jerking around a lot in your sleep. Orlando was having trouble getting his breath. His lungs seemed too shallow, and when he did manage at last to draw deeply, a wet cough rattled his bones. He sat up, accidentally dislodging Beazle's robot body, which rolled helplessly down onto the bed covers, then struggled to right itself. I'm... it was just a bad dream. He sat up and looked around, but his bedroom didn't even have a closet. Not that old-fashioned kind, anyway. It had been a dream, just the kind of stupid nightmare he had on bad nights. But there had been something important about it, something more important even than the fear. Beazel, now set on rubber-tipped legs once more, began to crawl away down the quilt, back toward its nourishing wall socket. Wait! Orlando lowered his voice to a whisper. I think, I think I need to make a call. Just let me lose the legs, boss. Beazle clambered awkwardly down the bed frame, heading for the floor. I'll meet you online. And that's where we're going to stop. <coughs> Woo! Raspy voices really take something out of me. Anyway, so with that, um, we are the end of the evening. Um, good to see you all. I see various folk have showed up since I started. There's Sally. I did say hello to Sally, I think. Um, no, I didn't say hello to Sally. So hello, Sally. Hello, Dale. Hello, Alan and Jan and Medardo. Okay, so with that, I am going to hang it up for the night. We will leave Orlando mid thing because some other stuff is just about to happen. Um, and we will leave you mid book since obviously we've still got a decent chunk to go. That's the whoop, doop, 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 we still got about a quarter left, maybe a little more. And I am going to say thank you, as I hope I always do. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for humoring me. Thank you for spending some time with me. And I will see you next week, next Sunday, 1 a.m primarily for the European folk. And this slot, 7 p.m., primarily for folks who are, can get it more easily in this part of the 24-hour day. So with that, peace. Y'all be good. Take care of your loved ones and your friends and those around you. We will all continue to take care of each other as best we can, and we will make a better world. So see you later. Bye-bye.